you that's my friend. What the hell is that? You're at Comedy Central. Welcome, welcome very, very much to this program. We're pleased to welcome to the program uh, Tony Fox, and Tony Fox is uh, with the uh, Comedy Central, the new cable television, national cable television uh, comedy venture, and Tony, welcome very, very much to Comedy Central. Thank you very much, Harold. It's we, nice to be here. We've got some clips of your programming and so forth, but maybe you could share at the outset the, the, the Comedy Central, when it got started, who's involved, okay. and that kind of thing, and then we can talk a little bit about you know some of the programming you all are doing. Okay. Uh, comedy Central is actually the product of a merger of two previous comedy channels. One was owned by HBO called Comedy Channel, and the other was owned by MTV Networks, and that was called Ha. And I guess the basic problem was is, uh, the cable systems around the country really didn't have room for two channels, and they kept prodding uh, both of the channels to, to merge, create a better network, and then they, they said that we'd probably be successful in getting distribution on the cable systems. Even though they recognized there was a lot of interest in comedy. Oh, comedy yeah, they, they never, right? they never yeah. doubted the appeal yeah, of an right. all-comedy network, but right. they just realized that they didn't need two of them. All right, right. So uh, economics, more than anything else, sort uh -huh. of forced us into that decision, but right. as it turns out, it was the right decision in that we have experienced a great deal of growth since then. Yeah, when did you get started? Now? Um, as a the merger network. was announced on the 1st of January of 91, but we went on the air as the new network on April 1, April Fool's Day, not uh. so coincidentally. <laughs> uh, coincidentally. Coincidentally. Not planned, not planned. <laughs> well, did you plan it that way? It was also the end of a business right. quarter, so oh, it see, made right. sense okay. from a business right. standpoint, right. and right. we were lucky that it was April Fool's All Day. Right. Uh -huh. But uh, we went on the air with about 12 million uh, subscribing homes, and we have uh, added about 10 million in 1991. And hey, that's pretty good. It really is pretty good, good growth given the fact that cable systems now, because there are so many channels out there, really don't have uh, a lot of extra channel spots yeah. uh, to add new services. Uh, throughout yeah. the country, there are a lot of systems that are uh, adding fiber optic te yeah, technology, right. and there's also this new technology called uh, signal compression, which allows uh, a system to add more channels or fit more channels into a limited amount of space that yeah. a, a coaxial cable will carry. But, that is uh, coming so that it will be realistically, absolutely, it's realistically already, the people in the United States are going to be able to have more channels absolutely, than they have. It's, it's happened already. I mean, within the time, a reasonable period of time, yeah? It's right Right now, there is a system in Queens that's mm -hmm. owned by Time Warner that has uh, 150 channels. Uh -huh, okay. And the idea is, uh, in addition to a lot of services like Comedy Central, uh, there are probably 30 or 40 different networks that exist right now. Uh, but they're also planning to add uh, a lot of pay-per-view channels where you don't ha necessarily have to wait for a given time to start watching a, a movie. Right. Uh, you could just punch it up. It's sort of like video on demand. Yeah, There's right, enough choices right. where you can in effect. There's a little look at interactivity there. Then it begins to right. introduce. Yeah, right. And but but anyway, you got this thing started here, we and you combined these forces, right? And right. Uh, you've had a pretty good growth. Now, tell we me have. a little bit what it is. It's 24 hours, It's right? 24 hours, uh, all comedy. It's ad-supported. Mm -hmm. um, we basically have a... We pretty much cover the gambit in all types of comedy yeah. genres. We have stand-up comedy, and lots of it. We, yeah. we have a library of over 1,000 hours of stand-up comedy, which uh, I believe is the largest... Uh, stand-up library in the world. A thousand we, hours of stand-up comics. Right, Great. and we're adding to it constantly. Yeah. In fact, on Monday, we're going to be up at yeah. uh, Stand-Up New York to shoot uh, another probably dozen comedians to feed into our our library. Uh, our library. And yeah. we have a couple of shows that utilize the comedy, stand-up comedy from the library. One is called Short Attention Span Theater, which is a very <laughs> popular show, uh, given today's uh, mini-bite mentality, yeah. if you will. Uh, it's hosted by two stand-up comedians, and it is it shows a lot of comedy clips, but it also is a news and information show as well. Yeah. It will tell you uh, news about comedians, the big-name comedians. It'll talk about upcoming theatrical film releases or video releases of comedy films. Um, it's sort of our version of Entertainment Tonight in yeah. that it provides both entertainment but also news and information. And it in and of itself is comedic. Right. Yeah, and, right and the right. two hosts, one's a woman, Patty Rosborough, yeah. the other is Jon Stewart, yeah. and they're stand-up comedians themselves, yeah, so they're right. constantly ad-libbing and having a good time on the show. Yeah, and I saw some of the literature. You have about 45, because uh, maybe one thing we say here, you also have another, some of the old classics, right? We do. We Jack have Benny. We have some of the best classics there yeah. ever was. Ernie Kovacs, yeah. the Jack Benny Show, the Steve Allen Show. Show of shows you show 
of shows. Sid Caesar? Yep, absolutely. That is currently stuff. not on Carl our schedule, Reiner, but it's in our library. These people who wrote for that. That's um, I'm sorry, what did you say about Show of Shows? Show of Shows is currently not on the schedule. It's in oh. our library, and I'm sure it will be pulled back out and, and, and integrated into the schedule at I'm some sure point. I'm sure my age. But, you know, but that was it's great popular show. stuff. Great it really is. In those days. Yeah, right. um, but, and we, you, but you have these things. You have some of these classic shows that you do run. As we part do. Of your schedule, Sunday right? is is really our classic uh, lineup day, where we have a lot of those shows. Yeah. Uh, uh, in both the early afternoon and then later in the evening. Right. And we stack a lot of them up uh, together, and they're very popular, and they skew a little older than perhaps the rest of yeah, our network. Yeah, they probably would. Uh, or, or, and even some of the old movies, sort of classic yeah. comic movies. Right? right. We had a lot of uh, Laurel and Hardy stuff. We had a show which is, again, currently not on the schedule right now, but I'm sure will be brought back called... Uh, uh, Dead Comic Society, which mm -hmm. is really some of the old pre-1940 silent comedy films with Fatty Arbuckle and Harold Lloyd, uh, yeah. obviously Charlie Chaplin, and they are enormously popular and they're very difficult to find in a single place. Even with some of the young audience, you're targeting yeah. the young audience. And the idea is this particular show is hosted by Robert Klein, uh -huh. who uh, provides anecdotes and, and historical facts about these particular comedians to try in an attempt to in reintroduce this material to a younger audience. Yeah, right. Because right. a lot of them obviously are, are, have not been exposed to the people who created both film and television comedy. So, given some of these classics as you have, you might have film classics that were done in the can. You have rights to and everything. Right. Monty Python, you said you have. Yeah, that's that's others. you know that's, that's a, a little more recent. Yeah. We have Monty Python's Flying Surf yeah. Circus, which was a huge hit on PBS. As yeah, you know. it'll run forever. Uh, uh, yeah. We have SCTV, Second City Television, which yeah. has some of the big comedy film stars of today featured in it, like a John Candy or yeah. a Martin Short. Uh, we have Kids in the Hall from HBO, which is a Canadian comedy troupe. That's not in the classic yeah. realm yet, but yeah. it certainly was popular. Uh, we have Black Adder, which is also from Great Britain, which is very, very popular. Yeah. Um, yeah. A lot of and stuff. You, and you had, uh, what's it, Saturday Night Live? Saturday, we have Saturday, Saturday Night, Night Live. Live. We have yeah. all the episodes from 1980 to the present, with the exception of, of course, the ones that are currently on You had to work out the rights to these things. And yes, like we that. did. That's all been done and everything like that. We acquired those rights, and I think we are likely, given how successful uh, Saturday Night Live performs for us, it, yeah. it's among the highest rated programming on, on the network. Yeah. Uh, we're going to continue to acquire rights to every season as it comes out. So Might we'll, as well get those classic things. I mean, yeah. Michelangelo was good. Our, That's yeah. right. But at the same time, about 41, now you said more 45. It's now up to about 45%. Stuff, new yeah, right? we it's have original programming. Uh, one show that seems to be the major breakthrough hit, if I could compare it to anything on, on television, it's sort of the equivalent of The Simpsons on Fox, is oh. uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000 for yeah. us. And the premise is this guy is shot into outer space by mad scientists and forced to watch terrible B-movies. And, <laughs> and you basically see the yeah. entire B-movie spool in front of you, and this guy, out of loneliness, builds two robot companions who sit in the front row of a theater, and you see them silhouetted against the screen. Yeah. And all they do is rip apart these movies for two hours, and they're very, very funny guys. Uh, there's about 700 jokes per show, and it is a major, major Making it up as they go along? Well, it or looks it like they're making it up. Yeah, it's right. scripted. Yeah. They watch the movie about eight times, yeah. and, and they continue to add and refine the script as they go, but it looks like it's ad-libbed. Uh -huh. And they draw upon uh, references to television, pop culture, history, philosophy. There's a joke in there for everybody. Yeah. And I think the better read you are, the, more, the funnier the show is, yeah, because right. there are so many references that I think the everyday person might not necessarily catch, but yeah. I think the more you read, the more you appreciate the so show. So about 45% of your stuff is right. original, right? That's right. And there's some of them are series that you do? You Lots of them yourself, are series. We and have then you go out and get some stuff from stand-up people? Alan yeah. King does a thing. Alan so. King does a show for us, which is an original show, and his show, even though it looks like a talk show, it's really not a talk show mm -hmm. in that uh, he, it's a half-hour show, and he talks to the legends of comedy, uh, yeah. Roseanne Barr, Billy Crystal, the biggest names in comedy, and some of them are the older guys like Funny a Milton Burrow. Yeah, right. But it's, it's not a, a talk show in the true sense that they're there to plug their latest projects. Yeah. What it really is is an attempt to discover <coughs> what, what made these people comedians, how mm. they found their comic vision. Yeah. And, and interestingly enough, it often is some sort of... Uh, cathartic process. Yeah. It seems that they comedy had comedy is a cathartic. I process, think it is, you know? and many of you these know? comedians uh, seem to have a pattern where they had a difficult childhood, yeah. or they didn't get enough love right. as a child, and so, therefore yeah. they yeah. they created this yeah. act that helped draw attention yeah, and cruelty to normal. themselves. They're not, they're not normal, run of the mill. You know, they're usually people who are sort of a little bit 
alienated. Them. You know, right. Mel Brooks one time did a, but they're very. Mel good. Brooks did his show, by the oh, way. Uh, Mel Brooks yes. got involved, right? Yes. Mel Brooks one time did a very interesting thing because they they tend to be comedic and they're laughing and everything like that. But he said, you know, the, very often they're interested also in uh, changing the world and, and making things better and everything. Mel Brooks once had a great line I heard him say. He said, "If you're serious about changing the world." You'd better not be serious, you know. Right. It could be part of that. There's a lot of uh, transformation that's in that. So you got a lot of these people. You're developing new things. Some English stuff. You brought some stuff. From yeah, we have too? two shows that we are doing as co-productions with British partners. One is Whose Line Is It Anyway, which is actually going to be shooting here in New York in a couple of weeks. That's a spontaneous. Yeah, it's yeah. it's 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 set up like a game show, but what it really is 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 live instant improvisation where an audience will suggest different topics and the performers will then break into songs or different skits that are based upon the suggestions that are made and it's Just hosted, right off the top of their head. They're brilliant. They uh, are brilliant. They literally instantaneously create yeah. characters and comedy and sketches yeah. right off the bat. And, and, yeah. and it's a very successful show for us. It won an Ace Award, which yeah. is the cable's equivalent of the Emmys. And we are, um, again, we're going to produce some more shows. For, are you for producing 92. that then? You're producing we co produce. You co produce that with London. Uh, yeah, yeah it's, right. it's on Channel 4 in England. Yeah. The production company is called Hattrick Productions, but right. we help finance the production of that show. And it airs both in England and here in the States. Are, are you seeing comedy? Oh, are you seeing your program carrying in England? Or not? Well, it's it's Hattrick Productions is a British company, yeah. so they air it on Channel Four in England, yeah. but it also airs here at, uh, on Comedy Central. Yeah, that's so. right. They haven't got cable in England to where they'd be carrying Comedy Central well, out of New York into. They London. don't have cable like we have Bristol cable, and Liverpool, uh, but they yeah. do yeah. have. They are going to launch a Comedy Channel in England, and I believe it could already be on the air. It's eight hours a day, and it's on a satellite, a direct broadcast satellite network called B Sky B. Uh -huh. uh, but as it turns out, um, whose line is it anyway? Is on Channel Four, which is is a commercial network in uh -huh. England. Uh, the other show we do is called London Underground, which right. features comedians from both the United States and Great Britain. And it also, just to throw it in into the mix, we throw in a high-profile musical act like a David Bowie or a Sinead O'Connor. And it's an attempt to, number one, showcase humor from both sides of the Atlantic, but yeah. it's also an attempt to uh, use stand-up in a different format. Yeah. There's so much stand-up on television today, mm -hmm. on, on various cable networks, and even on, on Fox has their own stand-up show. And the, the, they all look the same. It's a guy with a microphone standing in front of a brick wall doing stand-up. Yeah, but the guy's got to have the timing right, and there's some sure, guys do it sure. better than You've others. Sure, sure. You've got to be good. Is really good is good. You that's know? true. I mean, I mean, clearly, the material I mean, is, is the star. you got to to some of those stand-ups when they're really good. I mean, because that's, well, that's anyway, true. I, I don't mean to tell you your business. No, but, but what we try to do is make it look different. Yeah, we try right. and package stand-up in a way that it doesn't look like stand-up. Oh, and another okay. example of that is a show right. called Comics Only, which yeah. is hosted again by a stand-up comedian. Uh, but it's a it's a show purely for comedians. But they don't stand up in front of a brick wall and a microphone. They sit down on a couch like they'd be on the Arsenio Hall show. Yeah. And they perform their material in a conversational but way. But it's essentially stand up, it is sit stand -up. down, sit Absolutely. down, stand up. Right. right. That's but it what doesn't look like stand up. You have a show called Stand Up, Sit Down. Right. No, sit down, stand up, or something like that. But so. you have all of these things going 24 hours a day. Right. And it's going well. Demographics are good. And so Demographics, we are, uh, we're targeting 18 to 34 year olds yeah. because. Uh, number one, that is an audience that is underserved by television today. There are very well, few networks MTV. out there. MTV skews a little younger than that. MTV yeah. really uh, skews sort of to the 15 to 20 to 25. VH1. VH1 does hit 18 to 34, as does Fox. Like 30 olds getting older, right? 34? It's amazing. 34 but there are a lot of vehicles that yeah. deliver yeah. older. I yeah. mean, you get broad-based networks on cable like yeah. a TNT or even an ESPN that yeah. appeal to a huge, wide range yeah, right, audience. Right. You're right. And uh, advertisers will pay a premium if you can deliver in any quantity that particular demographic. But how come it is comedy is going to the young kids? Why isn't comedy going to everybody? I love comedy. I think comedy is great and satire yeah. and biting edge satire and, you know, well, Shakespeare. Just, Couldn't just, we have a Shakespeare? Or, no, I'm, I'm just sure sort of playing with you here a little bit. You know. I think but it, it is, even but though the we young target, people are particularly keen to com on comedy. Right? I think so. Uh, I mean, I, it, we're not trying to exclude uh, either people younger or older. I can in fact, watch. Of You'll course, watch of course. And I cable. think there's I a lot watch, of stuff right? on our network that appeals to to uh, older folks as well as younger folks, but um, the stuff that we're creating ourselves, I think, skews a little younger. But as yeah. I mentioned, the classics earlier are very, very popular with the 40-plus set. So I'm going to watch. I hope I'm so. telling you, Tom. I'm going to watch. I even hope though so. I'm not screwed into We welcome all viewers. Just, we all don't right, discriminate right. against okay. viewers. We want everybody watching. Okay. Actually. Anyway, listen. You've brought me some clips and stuff like yes. that. So I got a couple of clips. We're going to show the folks, right, or the people that are viewing. Uh, 
I don't know how many of the 18-year-olds, well, we have 18-year-olds viewing, we do, we have that, you know. But we're going to, one is showing some of these programs, right? Okay, so yes. why, don't, why don't we know that we have a number of them, and it's a little bit structured here, a number of these programs that you've been talking about. Then we want to come back and talk about a specific program that you did about the presidential election. Right. Right. Uh, no, the presidential State of the Union State address. Of the Union. But let's run this first clip so that if we could set that up in the studio. We have a clip. It's various pieces of the programming that give you a taste and a feel for the kind of programming they've been putting on this uh, you know, incredibly interesting and fun channel, Comedy Central. We're talking here with uh, Tony Fox uh, from, from the organization. So set that up in the studio. We'll run that now then, please. Thank you. You're at Comedy Central. See, that's my friend. Who is that? <laughs> we aren't stewards, we're flight attendants. Yeah, well, whatever you are, go fetch me some peanuts and a Diet Coke. <laughs> Before six in the morning, I automatically say, Death in the family, death in the family. With ah! a lot of money. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Here <laughs> are the rules of the Jewish religion, as far as I can tell. See if you can follow the logic. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, don't eat pork. A little message to every good athlete in the audience here tonight. Every hour you're in the gym working out, I'm in a bar talking to your girlfriend. I wish blindfolded Mexican children would dance under me. Thing, things Jose Feliciano might say. At 34, I'm not married, I'd give up. Really, it was just my cousin's wedding. I caught the bouquet. I just took it home and repotted it. Hit me with your big stick, you wild Mexican, you. <laughs> Things Angie Dickinson might say. Welcome back to Cinema Attractions. And now on the program, we're looking at Silence of the Lambs, the new film with, of course, Anthony Hopkins. Here's a brief clip. Okay. Thank you. While preparing for the upcoming birth of his first child, Warren Beatty reportedly passed out as he watched a childbirth video. A friend said he suddenly turned white and fainted dead away, an ice pack was needed to revive him. You know, the same thing happened to me when I saw Ishtar. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, you ever get pulled over by I mean, you probably get pulled over by cops a lot, right? I got pulled over one time for speeding, and I told the cop I was going to be on The Tonight Show that night, and he didn't give a damn. Yeah. You know, he said, I don't know who you are. <laughs> yeah. If I'd been Ed McMahon, I could have been drunk. He probably would have let me go. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Alan King, comedian. And tonight, we go inside the comedy mind of Martin Short, Dennis Miller, Billy Crystal, Roseanne Barr, Richard Lewis, Gary Shandler, George Carlin. So what you're saying is that you think that if you go out there and you use a couple of crazy words, outrageous things, and you're gaining their attention. It doesn't have to be, you know, wor words per se. It can be an image. It can be a thing you thought of. Civil war. Do you think any country could really have a civil war? <laughs> say... Pardon me. <laughs> I'm awfully sorry. Mr. Putin, the very real problem is one of mine. I'm afraid that the Ministry of State is no longer getting the kind of support that it needs. You see, there's defense, social security, health, housing, education, city walks. They're also Who gets to sing on this show? Me or Dennis? Who's Dennis? <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rin Tin Tin. Before the show starts, I'd like to introduce the gentleman on my left. His name is Steve Allen. What is the budget problem that the average man faces? So let's find out as we meet our first man on the street. There he is. What's the question, old noble king of the cat people? <laughs> well, Gordon, here it is. How do you handle your budget problems? How do I? Oh, the old Casherino. Mm -hmm. Oh, the old Mizumo. Well, I take my income and I put away 1% of it for necessities and the other 99% I spend on myself. <laughs> I just go wild. 99% well, of your income, isn't that an awful lot of money just to spend on yourself, Gordon? Don't you think I'm worth it, Slim? Oh. Doctor, what would you consider the most important element in gaining self-confidence, respect, and new friends? <coughs> new friends, huh? The most important element. 
Well, it's kind of hard to say. It's, it's sort of a, you know, you, you can't explain it. It's, it's something that when you feel it, you know, it's... I, but like when you see somebody walking, you see when he walks, you know, it's a... <laughs> I don't know, it's kind of a whole thing that... And it's more of a... I, don't, I can't explain <laughs> Money. <laughs> Real talent can be hidden almost anywhere. And that's pretty much what our show is all about. Public access television. Television created by everyday people. My party out. If I want to. If I want to. If I want to. You would. Do if it happened to you. Four contestants are going to make up an American musical based on the life of somebody here in the studio audience. Have you got uh, any sort of happy experiences you can recall in any time in your life, a happy experience? Well, the birth of my children. Birth of your children, that's very good. So, Bernard, doctor, birth of your children. Any nasty experiences? Yes, an attack of mumps. An attack of mumps. Yeah. Okay, so we want uh, plenty of travelling in this uh, right around the world uh, for uh, Bernard here, who's a doctor, featuring the birth of his children and an attack of mumps. <laughs> uh, those are the, the classic... Uh, features in most American musicals, I think. Uh, so, where you go. Take it away. Oh, thank goodness. That's surgery finished for today, darling. Oh, hi, hi Bernard. Hi. Oh, it's kicking. Yeah. Oh. Wow, that's going to be some kind of football, right? Oh, oh, or a doctor, maybe. There's hoping. Can you feel something? Yeah. Oh, please, Bernard, let me take your coat. Let me feel your throat. Oh, you've got lumps. You've got the mumps. Oh, no. I was thinking when I got up this morning and I looked down there, I thought, <laughs> hey, that's something big and it's not just air. <laughs> Will it affect our chances of traveling the world? No, Bernard, no. Lots of joy will soon be unfurled. Oh, 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 Bernard, no, Bernard, breathe, 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 I remember the first time I went fishing? Yeah. I thought it was the greatest thing in the world. My dad took me fishing, and I caught a flounder. Yeah. And then when we got home that night, he made me eat it. And I thought, <laughs> I want no part of this. <laughs> so I, want, I want no part of this activity fishing. I remember the first time I ever uh, caught a deer. I went hunting with my father, and I shot it with a bow and arrow. And I had to slice open the stomach, pull open the skin, pull out the heart, and drink the blood. True story. OK. Let's start this uh, next sweep now uh, about our friends from the deep. Jack Carter, Gary Shandling, and up first, Rich Jenny. I'm going to France next week to find out. I'm looking to see Jacques Cousteau there. My favorite French guy of all time. Loves his job. No matter how many times he watches salmon go up a stream, he still can't believe it's going on. <laughs> He's standing there happy with a woolen hat and a suntan going, nobody knows why the salmon do what they do. <laughs> Each year, millions of them do what they do, and even though they die when they're done doing what they've did, they go back and do it again. <laughs> Why do they do it? Jock, he's a fish. Get a hobby and lie down. <laughs> You're at Comedy Central. Southern California is where the word dude comes from. I've watched the word dude develop over the years. It's turned into a word kind of like the Polynesian word aloha. You know, that's more than just one meaning. use it to say hello to people. <laughs> Most important is you blew it. Dude. <laughs> Dude. It can also mean are you in the closet with a knife? Dude? That was
was great. That was good. I mean, it gave a little taste of a lot of the different pieces that you have. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, of uh, it, it went too fast. We could have gone into a great length in some of those things, but it's really funny. And it's hard to get... It's also the context of that, but it's really funny. It also gives a wide variety of the programming that you do do. You must be having a good time helping to put this together over there. I'm having a great time. You're having time. a good time in the executive offices Absolutely. as well as all the guys it's, it's, on the stage? It's very exciting to be part of a, a, uh, a company that is very young. Uh, we're small right now. We're not making any money yet, but I mm -hmm. think uh, the promise is quite... Uh, uh, encouraging young think, gifted and broke right yeah unfortunately yeah. right yeah. now but we do mm -hmm. have parents with deep yeah. pockets they believe in what we're doing yeah. and I think ultimately we're going to be very successful yeah those I uh, think the one philosophy that we have and, and it's part of our positioning for the network is that um, people have a very stressful day working uh, yes. you know the, the subway gets stuck uh, the weather's bad there are a lot of things in our lives that it can be like stressful and upsetting yeah, and right. if we can provide an escape or a laugh when people get home from work all uptight uh, we think we're doing a good thing, and we think people will tune to us as well, a result. Well, if, if, we, if we need an increasingly uptight world in order to get better demographics than comedy, you've got a good world <laughs> you're living in, you know, because it's getting that way. And we want to have fun. Yeah, okay, good enough. Why not? Because, and again, back to like Mel Brooks said, if you want to be serious about change, uh, don't be serious, you right. know. But in any event, this thing we want to, this other piece that we want to talk about is this uh, thing that you got incredible reviews, uh, Marvin Kipman, you know, and other people gave you this incredible review about this thing you did recently. We're talking now February 1991, right. uh, which was the State of the Union Address by the President of the United States. And you did right. this program that was apparently, I haven't been able to see the whole thing, hilarious. Talk, talk a little bit about that. First of all, what, what, it was a State of the Union address, and you somehow got a feed for that. Right. Or Basically, what we decided to do, and this, this idea to do this came out of a quote-unquote buzz committee, mm -hmm. which is a group of people at the company who were assembled to try and create events or programs that would create a lot of noise and awareness for the channel. Yeah. Uh, and we've always felt that it was important, and humor in particular, the best humor is topical humor, yeah. things that people can relate to. So we came up with the idea of covering the President's State of the Un Union Address live and having, rather than a Dan Rather or a Peter Jennings analyze the speech afterwards, as the networks do, uh. we would analyze it during the course of the speech itself using our own comedy analysts. Perfect. And uh, <laughs> after the speech ended, we also had a roundtable discussion afterwards, and mm. it involved a lot of sort of like a sports commentary, yeah. you know, mm. you had an analyst and a play-by-play -play oh, guy, commentary. Right. You're and we had a lot of funny of graphics, yeah. and mm. uh, uh, we rolled in some segments, man-on-the-street interview type things, yeah. and it was a huge hit for us, uh, largely because the House of Representatives and the three broadcast networks and CNN initially attempted to block our access to the speech. Talk about the feed that. This is out important. of the White House. Yeah, yeah. Now, this is the president had said this is a defining moment in his presidency. Right. All the nation is ready for this. They're really right. important. This is serious stuff, right? Right. And what you wanted was to have a feed, the same as the networks, right. to come for live commentary. With video with uh, Comedy Central, right? And right. they gave you a little flack on that. They did. Uh, right, talk they about felt it. number one that we were not a legitimate news organization. They didn't. Think, they gave you that line again, right? right? You're did. not really legitimate, right? And uh -huh. uh, we basically felt we we thought we had a very strong First Amendment position in that. Uh, uh, in effect, the speech was public property, mm -hmm. and uh, we didn't think that the broadcast networks or any news organization was in a position to determine whether we were a legitimate news organization. Legitimate. We're right. legitimate. We are a legitimate organization yeah. here and by God's And we felt a certain responsibility as a comedy network to and provide, a responsible legitimate right, organization. To provide right. an alternative view. Yes. Uh, generally the broadcast networks and CNN will pay lip service to a president or any f official proceedings. Rarely will you see a Dan Rather or a, a Peter Jennings challenge mm. something that is said either by the president or our government in general. Uh, we weren't restricted in any way and we felt that um, number one there are a lot of people at home who probably are heckling the president as he is uh, speaking on their TV and right. why not hire some professionals to do it for them right, right, right. Uh, and so uh, when they <laughs> said that we couldn't have the feed we contacted our Washington based lawyers and in effect said we want to um, challenge them on a first amendment on first amendment grounds good for you and uh, we thought also that it was ironic that these particular news organizations who live and die by the First Amendment were mm. prepared to deny us our own First Amendment rights. So mm -hmm. clearly they recognized we had a, pos a very strong position and they backed down and we ultimately did get the feed. And you got the live feed. So we here's did. the president is addressing. You can watch it at ABC and listen to the right. president. Or you could listen to CBS or CNN. Or you could listen to Comedy Channel. And you got on the Comedy Channel with the president. 
you got a running commentary. We did. As well as the president's address. And we got a lot of marks, uh, not only for just attempting to do this. Everybody, uh, many of the critics, television critics around the country, called it brown, groundbreaking, uh, history making. It, it was, may it was well something be. That I no wonder one if you realize done. what you've done. I think you've done something that might very well be groundbreaking. Well, we, yeah, right. we clearly, based upon the press reaction and, and our viewer reaction and our ratings, we mm. doubled our normal ratings for that time period. So Great. We, we know that there's a market for this kind of thing out there and mm -hmm. we are right now uh, brainstorming on some other events uh, that we might take on certainly 92 is a big political year with the mm -hmm. campaign yes. so we're looking at the debates the democratic debates we're looking mm -hmm. at the conventions we're looking at uh, covering perhaps the election live itself mm -hmm. um, and we're looking at some other sort of sacred cow institutions mm -hmm. like the Oscars or the Miss America beauty pageant wherever there is a lot of attention uh, we think that perhaps we ought to show up and provide a different uh, perspective on that event. Because you are a legitimate network. You are we a legitimate, are legitimate service network. and you're giving a legitimate yeah. service. And people but, like to laugh. Yeah, but in any event, so here's the president and it's laughable stuff. Some and I mean, of it? I mean, I've had some people say you don't need satire anymore, or, you know, comedy, because life itself is so funny. But at right. the same time, if you have some, you know, sophisticated additions to this, it just adds a little bit of a professional touch to it. So you had these pe people commenting on it, right? right. And they were saying uh, various things and commenting. And saying, yeah, one of the That's opening lines was um, uh, our two sort of hosts of the show, or not hosts, but I guess our lead analysts were lead Billy Kimball, yes. who is a uh, former editor of National Lampoon, and Al Franken, who's both a writer and performer for Saturday Night Live, and mm -hmm. Billy Kimball opened with the line, uh, what do you expect from the, the, the president uh, in his speech? And Kimball said something like, or uh, Franken said, well, I expect an apology. <laughs> uh, he promised us 30 million jobs uh, in 1991, and uh, uh, so far we're about uh, 30 million short. <laughs> and there are a number of references where just a single zinger was, yeah. was, was really what made it funny. Yeah. There was another, another reference that the president made about the Puritans laying awake at night, wondering a, about people out there somewhere yeah. having a good time, mm -hmm. and, and Franken pipes in, Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton. Oh, right. oh, I so, see. Yeah, right, right. Just put so, a few things in yeah. there. He did, they didn't over do it and we heard a lot of it no, in fact, it, there but was they even, overdubbed and they did it live they did it live so they, they had to live. be really on top of what they, they did were doing. They, we managed to get a copy of the speech about a half an hour before we went on the air uh, so, I see right uh, you know it was a long speech it was an hour long so it was, it was long, difficult yeah. for them in only a half an hour of time to really prepare stuff in advance you uh -huh. know, there were certain things that were scripted in advance knowing that he would be talking about the economy perhaps talking about the Japanese yeah. so there were some lines that were pre-prepared but a lot of it was ad lib and you were able to set up a few little graphics, graphics lots of graphics that lots you could of graphics. Bring in. We had little windows where there were cartoons and so and like a nightline, you could bring graphics yeah, that would absolutely. bring the things so they would give that uh, live presence. So you right. had to you had we to get had that all set up in the computer ahead of time. Right. Yeah. Right. So we, you had to get ready for this. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. There was a and we decided to do this only about a month before we actually went on the air with it. So right. it was a real scramble on the part of our company in terms of devoting resources to right. it. Right. Well, listen. Let's do this now. We have a little. It's all together too small. We can watch the whole thing. We have a little clip, right? some of that. So let's give that to the audience now. A little bit of a clip of this uh, groundbreaking. I do think it's groundbreaking uh, piece that the Comedy Central people did now. So if we set that up in the studio and run that now, then it's the State of the Union address as seen by the uh, commentators at uh, Comedy Central. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt our regularly scheduled programming to bring you the following live presentation. Central, the State of the Union, undressed. And welcome to the State of the Union Undressed. Like everyone else across this really big country of ours, we here at Comedy Central are on the edge of our seats, eagerly awaiting the President's words on the nation's present and its future. There's been much speculation on tonight's address. Will the President call for massive cuts in military spending? Will he propose yet another revised tax package? And most importantly, will he be throwing up on anybody in his vicinity? If so, it's expected to be a Democrat or at least a moderate Republican. Standing by to give us the presidential play-by-play -play are our state-of-the-art, state-of-the-union experts, Comedy Central's chief political correspondent, Billy Kimball, and Saturday Night Live's Al Franken. 
Then following the State of the Union Address, we will join our roundtable of crack political correspondents for an in-depth analysis and a translation into English of the President's speech. Joining us at that time will be Richard Belzer, Joe Queenan, Marilyn Suzanne Miller, Dennis Leary, and some very, very special guests. It looks like the uh, President is uh, about to enter the Capitol, so without any further ado, I'm going to hand you over to our correspondents, Billy Kimball and Al Franken. Billy? Thank you, Paul. Uh, you're looking live at the Capitol of the United States. Those doors, by the way, are made of bird's eye maple. That is the Sergeant at Arms, and he's making some kind of announcement. Ah, announcing the President of the United States he's entering the building. George Bush. Uh, while the President is entering, Al, let me ask you, what are you looking for in tonight's speech? Uh, basically, I guess uh, I'm looking for an apology. You know, the uh, President uh, promised, among other things, in 1988 to create 30 million uh, new jobs during his first term, and he's short by uh, approximately uh, 30 million. So this is a, a big speech for the President, but I, I uh, look for him to take credit for Operation uh, Desert Storm, uh, also for the end of the Cold War, and he'll do that early. Also, I believe he'll mention Elvis uh, and look for him to do that early as well. Al, I think you're neglecting the fact that the President certainly created two jobs here tonight in the form of, of yours and my own. Well, one. Right, you have a job. Okay, uh, before the President begins to speak, I think you can expect him to reach the, uh, reach the podium in just a moment. He's shaking uh, hands with, with uh, uh, Speaker Foley. Dan and Quayle and his father. And... Uh, Let's go and listen to uh, uh, Speaker Foley's announcement. Speaker Foley, go. Anytime. <laughs> we are ready for you, Speaker Foley. And Mr. President, put down the glass, please. Ah, oh, dear. I was afraid this would happen. Now, they, uh, by the way, the President has enlisted the aid of uh, Peggy Noonan uh, in this speech, or his staff has. They've done nine drafts of this speech, and uh, Peggy Noonan, who wrote uh, such phrases as... Uh, Barbara looking on there, accompanied by uh, a lady in waiting. A uh, thousand points of light, kinder, gentler nation, read my lips, uh, has helped craft this speech, and all of us are kind of looking for what the new phrase will be. I think it'll be some kind of attack on that uh, Belgian Ondive research program, would be my guess. I don't know what you're talking about, Billy, but uh, we were talking, uh, some of the panelists before, Joe Queenan, uh, one of the panelists who will be on later, thought the new phrase might be, stand by your man, kind of a reference Tammy to the I think the, uh, the new f phrase will be, care, boy, do I. That's what I'm looking for. Thank you. I'll be keeping my eye out for that now. I think we're still waiting for Senator, uh, for uh, Speaker Foley to introduce the president. By the way, the capital of the United States built on the site of an old Indian graveyard, uh, formerly known as Jenkins Hill. Uh, and those are, uh, I don't know if you can see them, but it's decorated with the coats of arms of all the states of the United States. That's got to be adding to the atmosphere hey. down there. Oh, he's looking at his watch, and so on. You know, last year uh, he introduced certain people. Remember the atmosphere? Sure. Was quite right different last desert, year. Uh, there's Desert Storm. There's the First Lady. Yeah. It was actually during Desert Storm last year. And then no. he had another one. You can't expect after me to keep track of everything. <laughs> no, I, I certainly don't. So last year he had Colin Powell, Mrs. Colin Powell, and Mrs. Norman Schwarzkopf uh, in the balcony this year. And I understand Jennifer they... Flowers will be introduced, and she, she will wave. You, I had a joke. Well, I'll, I'll keep listening. Mrs. I'll tell you. Next Mrs. Powell uh, has phantom tickets, I'm told, and, and they're the devil to get. Okay, they're quiet now. Aren't they? No. Members of the Congress. Here he goes. I have the high privilege and the distinct honor Watch well. of presenting to you the President of the United States. All right, uh, and while they're, uh, they're giving the President a standing ovation, let's hear from the first of our experts tonight on what to expect during the speech. this evening in the State of the Union address that uh, President Bush will be talking about the American economy, pushing people to invest back in the United States and creating jobs here at home. He'll also be talking about investing in the Soviet Union as well. All right, well, we'll be keeping our ears open there. That was for, a psychic. That was a psychic. But ironically, he? you wouldn't need psychic powers to make that kind of prediction. Well, uh, I don't think it's any proof that he doesn't have psychic powers. Thank you, all, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> I don't, don't think so either. Now, let's go to the president. Mr. He's Speaker. about to say something. Mr. President, oh, distinguished members of Congress, honored guests and fellow citizens, 
Thank you very much for that warm reception. You know, with the big build-up this address has had, I, I um, want to make sure it'd be a big hit, but I couldn't convince Barbara to deliver it for me. <laughs> I, Referring, of course, to the I, uh, vomiting in Japan, this should be a standing ovation. First Lady, uh, far more popular running mate for the president next year than, than his current she Vice President, very... Dan Quayle. And that's to be the first of our supers. Okay. No, I think it's the second, Al. <laughs> well, I've been watching. I can't rely on you to watch carefully, uh, no. I know. I see the speaker and the vice president are laughing. They saw what I did in Japan, and they're just happy they're sitting behind me. I, uh, I, Japanese ambassador wearing foul weather gear, I noticed when he entered. That Not was a very chances. good joke. I'm sure that was someone besides Peggy Noonan. I mean to speak tonight of big She's things. She's not funny of big ch changes and the promises they hold and of some big problems big that's the and how together we can solve them and move our country forward as the undisputed leader of the age and we gather george bush uh, is an episcopalian uh raised in connecticut tonight at a dramatic and deeply promising time in our history and in the history of man on earth my re-election for in the past 12 months the world has known changes of almost biblical proportions. And even now, months after the failed coup that doomed a failed system, I'm now, not sure there, we've Al? absorbed the full impact, the full import sorry, what? of what happened. The, the failed coup. But communism the, the, in, in, died in the Soviet Union. Oh, years. okay. Oh, yeah. Few. <laughs> no. no. Nothing. Nothing here. Nothing to worry about. Oh, boy. The, the, off the scale on the applause there for the, the failed system. Okay. Is that what that was for? Yeah. I'm losing right. track because we're the talking. Most fascinating possible vantage point. There were times when I was so busy managing progress and helping to lead change that I didn't always show the joy that was in my heart. But the biggest thing that has happened in the world, in my life, in our lives, is this. By the grace of God... America won the Cold War. All right, they're going to be applauding like all get out now, so why don't we hear from the second of our experts while this uh, standing ovation takes shape here. There's the cabinet. As a cosmetologist specializing in nail care, I would say that uh, prolonged uh, clapping of hands can irritate the hands. Um, because of the pressure applied. If the hands are dry, uh, the friction would cause perhaps tenderness and irritations. Now we can look homeward. Now Let's I missed some of the speech because of her. But and move to was, set right what so needs kind of to be set kind of right. To the world saw not only their special valor, but their special style. Their rambunctious, optimistic bravery. Okay, that's funny. Their do-or-die unity, up. unhampered by Al. class or <laughs> race okay. or region. What a group we put forth for generations now. From the ones who wrote Kilroy was here on the walls of the German stalags to those who left signs in the Iraqi desert that said, I saw Elvis. See, what there's that early Elvis. Kids we've sent out there into the reference, battle. I thought. There you have here, and that's very smart. Still, a lot of Elvis fans in this country, and in the Congress, obviously. The American taxpayer bore the brunt of the burden, and deserves a hunk of the glory. Hunk of the glory. And so now, oh. that really isn't that much money. Look at so that. Now that's not that much. The men and women of America's armed forces call and call our allies accomplished the goals that I declared and that you endorse. We liberated Kuwait. And okay, I think uh, it's time for another one of our experts uh, while there's uh, this applause. The ambassador of Kuwait there looking on, the dean of the diplomatic corps. And soon after, Oops. the Arab Oops. war Not enough in time, Israel clearly. sat down to talk. As a gastroenterologist, I would look for certain signs and symptoms during the president's speech. Uh, to see if he would be coming down with another episode of viral gastroenteritis. I would look to make sure that he did not develop profound sweating or become profoundly weak during the uh, speech. If he did, he might also be developing severe abdominal pain, which might lead to 
fainting, which might lead to severe nausea and vomiting and profound diarrhea, as it happened to him during his recent uh, trip to Tokyo. Well, we'll be keeping our eyes open for those symptoms. Let's go back to the president now. You know, it didn't take a psychic to know that we would be doing and, jokes about the bombing. And they There's regard Colin this with no dread, for the world trusts us with power. Now, are these true? And the the, all the facts right. we'll be hearing and seeing tonight are, in they fact, trust true. Us to be Ooh, honest, then I should be changing what I'm saying, because many of the they things I've us said to be on the side of are not true and will continue. They trust us to do what's right. This is a fact. Ooh. Strength in the pursuit of peace is no vice. Isolationism in the pursuit of security is no virtue. All right, we've got the president. That's a Patrick drift. Cannon reference. Okay. Pat Buchanan challenging the president in New Hampshire. They're not all economic. The primary problem is our economy. Wow, that is. And there's some that good psychic amazing. certainly called it out. Inflation, that thief is down and interest rates are down but unemployment is too high some industries are in trouble and growth is not what it should be and let me tell you right from the start and right right from the heart he i know we're in hard times but i know something else this will not stand all right, I think we know where the president's headed uh, let's go for a moment to our next expert uh, if we would please in on the videotape I'm uh, just going to talk a little In bit this more. Chamber. Just because the president is delivering his State of the Union address, this doesn't mean he has to be flabby while he's doing it. As a fitness professional, I suggest these series of exercises that are guaranteed to keep him in shape while he's delivering his speech. The first one is an arm workout. Place your hands on the side of the podium, gently press in. Here you're working the biceps and the triceps. Press out and in, now you want to squeeze down and in, and you're actually working a little bit of the rhomboid section of the back. We're not gonna stop there, George. Legs apart for some nice inner thigh work. Ready? Here, and take it down and squeeze it up. And here you can really get into your feet. Here, be aggressive right here. Work it right here, George, and work it. Right here, one more, work it right here. Let's go back to the president now. Tory well, we're ready. Kill must be stopped. I'm ready. Al. And Listen now, let me ask you. I know there's something you do know about. Uh, a lot of people think the president memorizes and the speech. Is that our is that in fact the case? Stop it. No, if they uh, <clears throat> we have no control of the feed, but in the wider shot you'll see the teleprompters mm. that uh, he talks to, and they to speed up those little screens, like in in Mission Impossible. So like one-way mirrors, extra right? Ten billion dollars in that was a that was a great show. Six months. It was. Uh, and I, I thought you'd be too young for that show. No, no, I was on when I was a kid. Reruns and, uh, and so forth. Peter Graves, Peter Lupus, Barbara Bain. You know, Martin Peter Lando. Graves was uh, James Arness's brother, and they're both from Minneapolis. And James Arness was was Gunsmoke. Gunsmoke. And I oh. this evening directed the secretary. <coughs> I was just in Minneapolis. I'm with the Super Bowl. The now who won that? Uh, the Redskins. Cute story. My uh, son was throwing up uh, on Sunday morning. We were afraid he was, he was too sick to go to the game, and he was lying uh, with his head in the toilet. And he said, "I'm smarter than the president." I made it to the toilet. Seven-year-old boy. Isn't well, that? right. Cute speaking, story. Speaking now of, we're just completely talking over the president. Speaking of, let's go back to the president. Initiative could return about $25 billion dollars <laughs> back into our economy over the next 12 months. Money people can use to help pay for clothing, college, or to get a new car. He said at the beginning, I'm going to do big things. To everyone who has a business or a farm or a single investment, this time, that lets me right hour, out. I cannot take no for an answer. You must cut the capital gains tax on yes. the people of our country. Uh, yes, I earn exactly half the House rising, I think, uh, in support of that. The commissioners of the major sports leagues there cheering. Now, this is, yeah, you, you're right. It's exactly half. <laughs> so, I wonder, you think that's the half that have capital gains? Well, it'd be, it's, it's split along party lines, but except, you know, Paul Sangas is for that. Oh. So. Never has an issue been more demagogued by its Oh, he's mad. But the Democrats he's mad. are wrong. He, they're wrong. They are wrong. And oh. they know it. 
60% of the people who benefit from lower capital gains have incomes under $50,000. Oh, now he's lying. A cut in That's the capital gains tax increases <laughs> jobs and helps just about everyone in our country. Okay. And Remember he said he'd do anything to win this election? That, that was just that... Oh, well. and so I'm asking you to cut the capital gains tax to a maximum of 15.4%. Now they're cheering about the I'm not point exactly four, sure the 15.4, would they have cheered for a... I'll they're on an applause, you, Jack. Say, oh, no. Someone who's comfortable may benefit from that. You kind of remind me of the old definition of the Puritan, who couldn't sleep at night, worrying that somehow... Someone, somewhere, was out having a good time. Bill Clinton. You know how the president's teaching us a thing or two about humor tonight, I think. Sure is. And God bless our beloved country. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. All right, there you have it. The president of the United States, 41st president of the U.S., and he tapped over Cleveland twice. George Bush concluding his State of the Union address to the Joint Session of Congress. Thank you all very much. Very moving. That M there. Uh, He's got a gift for Barbara, evidently, in left hand. And I think we can expect the president to leave, but not before uh, getting a firm pat on the back from uh, Dick Darman. From Dick Darman. No, that's the uh, sergeant the of arms. Sergeant of arms. That was a um, a well crafted speech. I thought he it was a good speech. What he had to do. I thought it was a good speech. I don't know if it was the home run that we were expecting, but we're going to get to that in just a minute with our panel. Before we do that, I want to uh, toss it back over to our friend Paul Provenza and uh, have him wrap us up from this good. section of our program. Paul? Paul. Yes, thank you very much, Billy and Al, Billy Kimball and Al Franken. And as you can see, President Bush is leaving the building. President Bush is leaving the building, and I am sure that much of Congress will be following him to have it out in the parking lot. He's basically challenged Congress, and I think this might end up in fisticuffs. As soon as everyone has settled down, our panel of experts will explain just what the hell the president was doing up there behind that podium. We'll be joining Richard Belzer, Joe Queenan, Marilyn Suzanne Miller, Dennis Leary, and others. So stay tuned as Comedy Central's State of the Union Undressed continues. Don't go away. with a big afro <laughs> president bush is he called <laughs> be a bush with a thousand points of light on it yeah. yeah that's it uh it would be very rigid and uh very stark just as he is rigid and stark That's funny. That's really funny. That's really funny. And it seems to me that they, uh, they have that. It may be groundbreaking in the sense that these serious things that are taken in these news things like that, not only the present, but other things that are taken where there's a, an inherent comedic thing brilled into it, that kind of thing. You might be able to do that with other UN, other kinds well, of I things, or so. other, as you say, sacred cows, where little com comments could be done live. You have to be clever, and you can't overdo it, and it has to be done... You know what I'm saying? Sure, yeah. absolutely. I mean, but that's, it's, it's, that's, a, it's a new kind of journalism, right? Yeah, I think so. I, I think, think you really hit on we're, something. We're here. on the leading Admiral, edge of something yeah. big, right? Yeah. Uh, we we looked at 1991 as a year that had a number of events that really captured people's imagination. Mm -hmm. Whether it was the Gulf War, the Clarence Thomas hearings, or uh, the William Kennedy Smith trial, there were certain events that the whole country was watching, and we realized that. Number one, we stand to benefit if the whole country is watching and is watching that particular event on our channel looking yeah. for laughs, that we yeah. can really benefit from that in terms of awareness for but the what channel. But what about if I may, like, you know, the Gulf War, there were a lot of people who said that uh, the press became a fifth estate. I mean, there are these serious people, right. Mel Brooks notwithstanding, right? But right. there are there are serious people who say well, they became a fifth estate for the United States. It became just a pep. But, you know, there could have been not only, if I may, I'm not telling you your business, you're in the business. I'm not in the business of comedy. You're in the business. Right. Right? You're the, you know, the funny people over there and everything. But you I mean, you could have some people who also have some facts in there. Right. I mean, you can have some facts in there, zinger facts that are funny, 
but are also countervailing to the establishment bias of the right. press. Now, There's can the, you do that sort of thing? I think so very you're much so. You're not part of the establishment? No, you're, I don't think you, we you, are. Well, you, would you take the establishment on at Comedy Central? I or, think we've already you know, started. Can you do that? Could you do it? Or would you I lose, think so. Uh, I you think know, we can. Are you lose backing and your advertising supported? And Can you do it or what? You know, um, what do you think? You know? I, I think we can do it. I hope okay. we can do uh, it. Uh, I mean, uh, again, I think th there's a, a line that you, you don't want to cross. Okay. I mean, there's a difference between comedy and, and just playing bad taste. And, and we'll and leave those to public access, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, go ahead. I'm talking. No, no. Well, for instance, during mm. the course of the President's State of the Union, there was reference to the Gulf War and other situations that were negative. Uh, where, you know, our commentators just, as they say in the business, laid out. They didn't say anything because mm -hmm. it perhaps would have been in bad taste. You don't want to make fun of the fact that this country had people who died serving their country. That's, there's nothing funny about that. Yeah, that's so right. You just right. There, there are, so there are, so there are some things like that. That's always a thing, right? right? Because then you're pushing the limits often, right? Right. And they're pushing the limits of taste often in comedy. Right. You, you know, can. that kind of thing. You yeah, can. It's inherent to the thing, you know? So you got to do it. There's some limits in that. But there are also, as you said earlier, there are a lot of sacred cows that allow to go just absolutely unchallenged, don't you think? Right. I, I think so. And, yeah, and the point and is we're, you know, with the State of the Union, we didn't personally attack George Bush. That was not our intention. We were trying to provide a different view of things. And mm -hmm. it just so happens George was the guy standing up there. But President there's no reason Bush. why. I mean, President Bush. Right. I mean, it's not, you don't, you know, George is a little. <laughs> Don't you That's think? True. I mean, I mean, all, I mean, I mean, you're an establishment organization. That's true. I mean, President you don't Bush. just so cavalierly say George. I mean, That's you know, true. I don't mean to. You know what I'm saying? I mean, yes, is I that, do is know that, what you're saying. No, you're that, right. You're right. <laughs> I'm just kidding with you a little bit. Mr. Bush was. Uh, Given the address, yeah. Right. But it could very well be Governor yeah. Bill Clinton. It could yes, be anybody could. that we take on. It's Mario not Cuomo, It's not a, you know, Mr. we're Lincoln. not pretending to be a uh, on the left or the right. In mm. fact, we made a concerted effort to have a balanced panel of comedians. Yeah. Some of them lean to the left, some lean to the right. That's good. So That's it's, good. it's not like we're, we're taking a specific political position. So the crossfire cross concept of the right. uh, from the right to the left comedian. Right. right. Yeah, we right. actually have another show that uh, is not on the air yet, but we are trying to develop with uh, MTM mm -hmm. uh, called Men in Suits, which is basically <laughs> a comedy McLaughlin report where uh -huh. you have a particular issue, and in the particular pilot we did, it was uh, 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 David Duke running for governor in Louisiana. Right. And we show a clip of, of his <laughs> campaigning, and then we get to the comedians who just absolutely rip them apart. And, and you're going to call it Men in Suits? Men in Suits. Love it, love it, love it. Men in blue, gray suits, right? Blue suits, right? right. Any kind blue, of suit. Any kind of suit like that. Well, that's good. I wish you all the best of luck as far as you can, and push those limits as far as you can in terms We're of try, try and get some of those sacred columns. So you're doing a good job, but also put on the other uh, beautiful, good stuff. Comedy is uh, stuff by which we all can live, and it helps. Uh, and again, keep saying Mel Brooks, if you want to be serious about changing the world, don't be serious. And Comedy Central might be a leading edge place for bringing and needling and providing you know, us all. And uh, if you do that sort of thing, you probably get a lot more viewers that aren't only in that 18 to 35 bracket. We'll take them all. You'll probably get your biggest contracts from Geritol pretty soon <laughs> if you keep doing it. But in any case, it's been a pleasure, right? Thanks for having me. And Welcome back to Comedy Central's State of the Union Undressed. Well, in his uh, speech tonight, President Bush made more outrageous promises to this country than Ted Kennedy to a cocktail waitress. And you know, he also put a lot of challenges to Congress to uh, pass some of the legislation he's been trying to get through and approve some of the uh, proposals he's been floating around there in Congress. And uh, I think we're going to see some interesting fights going on there in the future. Right now, we're going to join our panel of experts for some in-depth analysis of the president's speech. They're sitting with Billy Kimball. Billy? Thank you, Paul, and welcome to the second half of our program. I've been joined now by uh, a group of... of of funny and smart people, I hope, for uh, uh, a little bit of a panel discussion. Uh, on my right, not necessarily by virtue of her political affiliation, uh, Marilyn Miller, a writer and producer whose work we've seen on Saturday Night Live and also on the op-ed page of the New York Times. On my left, and probably by virtue of his political affiliation, Richard Belzer, comedian and author. Uh, on my right, Dennis Leary, also writing a book based on his recent critically acclaimed off-Broadway show, No Cure for Cancer. And on my left, Mr. Joe Queenan, uh, write, currently writing, uh, what would you call it, Joe? A, uh, a large a rectangular word. object. A, a book. large rectangular object. <laughs> <laughs> a, a book, a biography of Dan Quayle. A uh, book sort about of a, Dan Quayle. A, a reassessment of Dan Quayle. 
And of course, uh, my friend Al Franken right here on the left. Marilyn, let me start with you. Uh, and I don't know if I can put you in this position, but speaking for at least 50% of the voters uh, who we haven't heard from yet, uh, what did you think of tonight's speech?